nor the uh, reference to a rising star. That is the kiss of death, you realise, for any aspiring politician here. Uh, what a pleasure to be here this Saturday morning, and we should all be proud of ourselves. This is what we're doing for Brexit, the great opportunity that our country now faces, and we're going to make the most of it, something that uh, we hear a lot of in Parliament and in the press, uh, and which we really need to grasp with both hands. So my name is Suella Fernandez. I'm the Conservative MP for Fareham, and I was very proud to have campaigned to leave the European Union. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our trade prospects and you know, dovetailing with Shankar, who is an eminent expert on this subject, um, who will overshadow anything I really have to say. Um, I, I'm going to focus more on the EU-UK trading relationship for the future and what that might look like. Um, but before getting to that, I want to look at the current setup and why leaving the customs union and the single market are essential if we are to make the most of this once in a generation opportunity of Brexit. So the question facing government and parliament really is how we best implement the will of the British people to make the most of um, uh, embarking on the great journey of national self-determination in terms of trade. So the problem with the EU, EU trade policy and the customs union is, to my mind, fourfold. Firstly, the EU customs union has simply not served the UK's trade interests at all. The EU has a laughable track record of signing free trade agreements with key markets for the UK. Of its 34 or so active FDAs, um, there are some significant ones, those with South Korea, Mexico and South Africa. But there is a glaring lack of trade agreements with major economies such as India, Brazil, we saw how the trade deal with the US failed, uh, and China. And the absence of multilateral trade deals is holding back not only the British economy, but the world economy. I have to give credit where it's due, Canada. Uh, and the recent trade deal finally, although it looked doubtful at uh, 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 various points, that the Canadian trade deal, which took about seven years to secure, is, I would say, a good trade deal. Um, about 99% of non-agricultural uh, tariffs will go. 92% of um, agricultural tariffs will be cancelled, um, there'll be generous quotas, and there won't be a requirement for freedom of movement, and there won't be an access fee. So that is, I do think, on balance, a good trade deal. But generally speaking, the EU's track record for securing trade agreements has been woeful. Secondly, EU protectionism is harming Britain. Growth will continue to stall in the EU, harming business and jobs. And the UK can only strike its own trade deals with non-EU country if it is outside the EU customs union because of the common commercial policy, which binds all of its members. Now, once we've left the EU and we seek new free trade agreements with the world's largest economies, as the Lakatum uh, Special Trade Commission has estimated, uh, we, the global world product stands to increase by about 50% over the course of 15 years. That's a massive boon for business, jobs, and citizens around the world. And it's not just major economies that are suffering because of the EU's protectionism, it's both British and EU consumers on the ground level. They are the ultimate losers of any form of protectionism. Our consumers, we, are all denied products such as cheaper sugar from developing states in order to protect less efficient farmers in, for example, Northern Europe. The EU Customs Union has pushed food and clothes prices up by virtue of the common commercial policy, estimated to be about £500 per household. So by opening up the market, lowering barriers to entry for new competition, prices will fall and consumers will benefit. Choice and quality win out, as producers no longer have a captive market or a monopoly.
Thirdly, the EU's trade agreements have focused too much on goods, uh, for example, agriculture, textiles, audiovisual and automotive, rather than liberalising services and new sectors and industries. And when 80% of UK GDP is services, there, and there are no real agreements relating to services, then we are losing out. The EU economy does not aim at building um, the economies of the future or the sectors of the future. And lastly, the protectionism of the EU severely penalises farmers and workers in developing countries when they export to the UK EU. For example, the EU imposes a tariff of 7.5% on roasted coffee coming into the single market and then 30% on processed cocoa products such as chocolate bars. And the effect of this, and I think James will touch on this because he has a real interest in um, how leaving the customs union can um, really help developing nations. The real effect of these tariffs is to stop, say, African countries from accessing the EU, uh, the EU market on a level playing field. More damaging than that and more long term is that there is no longer any incentive to, for African countries to invest in vitally needed industrialisation like agricultural processing, packaging and distribution. And that's exactly the kind of investment that African countries need in order to lift themselves out of poverty towards self-sufficiency, long term sustainable industrialisation. But the EU's policy of stifling that competition means it cannot really claim to be a friend of fair trade at all. So that's the case for leaving the customs union. And we've seen the Prime Minister set out emphatically, unequivocally and definitively her intention to do just that, which I applaud and am very much uh, in favour of. So in leaving the customs union, what should our new trade settlement look like with the EU? So importantly, I think we shouldn't slavishly or mindlessly mimic um, other countries like Norway or Switzerland or Jersey or even Canada, even though it is a good deal. The fact that no two non-EU states have identical deals with Brussels reflects the fact that Britain, just like any of them, will strike its own bargain tailored to suit its own conditions and needs. And I think there are several options to explore with what, uh, um, in terms of what our relationship should look like with the EU. It may well mean pure membership of EFTA without EEA obligations, like, for example, but not entirely, Switzerland, um, or some other bespoke agreement. The primary objective, above all, is to have a deal with the EU that covers free circulation of goods and services on the basis of national sovereignty. EFTA is an option, but only one. And I just want to look a little, more, a little bit more closely at EFTA and the advantages that it does present to Britain, bearing in mind that the Swiss setup is not perfect. I think the problem with the Swiss model is that Switzerland has allowed all of its agreements with the EU to become interlinked, intimately interlinked, so that a kind of house of cards has, become, uh, has been erected in that leaving one agreement necessarily renders any other agreement um, futile or otiose. It's also largely outside the single market for financial services. I would say that that hasn't necessarily, notwithstanding that, their banking sector is still flourishing, obviously. But the payoff, um, and, and they operate under a different regulatory regime when selling into the EU, the payoff being that they are exempt from EU laws. So there's a considerable benefit to that. So it's not perfect, but there are significant gains to my mind, if the UK were to join EFTA upon leaving the customs union. First of all, it would guarantee our continued free trade with the other EFTA states. Um, EFTA allows its members to negotiate free trade agreements with other countries. For example, um, Swiss, Switzerland and Iceland have a free trade agreement with China. Um, and it has a better track record than the EU at negotiating these deals. It's got a more global focus with uh, a focus on Asia and the Americas rather than the local focus that the EU seems to uh, engender.
And lastly, it would provide a framework for working with the EU, because there is already a regulatory structure and a small secretariat and tribunal in place. Would the EU27 agree to this? I think the answer to that is economics. It's as a simple truism that countries don't trade with each other out of kindness or some act of generosity. Countries trade with each other for jobs and business. And if Britain is Germany, Poland and Ireland's second largest export market in the whole world, we have a trading deficit of 70 billion pounds, larger than many other large economies. We have a goods deficit of 50 billion pounds, which is larger than even the Kenyan economy. Uh, we have the largest financial centre in London, in the world. I believe that millions, because of millions of EU jobs and businesses dependent or depending on that cross-channel trade, um, the economic well-being of those millions of EU citizens will play heavily in the minds of their political leaders during any negotiations. Their political lives indeed depend on it. And free commerce, after all, is always beneficial to both parties. So some questions still persist in terms of the UK-EU relationship. How will British businesses still trade freely and easily with the EU? Remainers and uh, proponents of um, the, the project FEAR commonly argue that our businesses stand to lose out from burdensome rules and tariffs if we leave the customs union. And the scenario that, for example, if the UK signs a free trade agreement with China, um, why shouldn't, uh, wouldn't that allow Chinese firms to sell into the UK and then move their goods tariff-free straight into the EU, thereby creating uh, a loophole which wouldn't be attractive to the EU? In response to those commonly uh, peddled fears, this is not a new dilemma. Indeed, it applies all over the world, and the WTO has worked out how to resolve it. Indeed, the Treasury Select Committee recently dealt with this issue in detail, taking evidence from customs and excise officials um, and trade negotiators. Simply put, this fear is overblown because there is considerable technology and experience to deal with it. For example, goods these days are generally shipped in bulk, so tracking whether a consignment originated in China is not a problem. The problem potentially would arise if China exported food to the UK and then had them tweaked in some way so as to be categorised as British for the purpose of re-export to the EU. But here, rules of origin bite. And they are technical schedules which, in effect, define how much of any given product has to be made in a country for that product to be labelled as coming for that, from that country. So... The practical effect of those WTO rules is that Britain would find itself subject to these customs checks, but their impact is minimal. Take, again, Switzerland, for example. In theory, there could be customs checks between Switzerland and the EU, but in practice, the Swiss border to the EU is almost seamless. And yes, there are Swiss customs officers who have the power to search and seize suspect vehicles. But in real term, terms, their border is open and millions of EU nationals pass it without passport checks every day. So for us, taking Britain, our port points of entry are seaports and airports, apart from the border with Ireland. And I consider that travellers and um, um, transit um, bodies and hauliers would notice no real difference. Business would continue as usual with red and green lanes as there are now, allowing for searches if needed. And for maritime freight, there are tariff-free areas in most large commercial ports in which goods can be landed and reshipped without formally entering the country. Because of the use of technology, it can take seconds. So fears about burdensome rules of origin and WTO rules are unfounded. The truth is that tariffs and other obstacles to the free movement of goods are, to my mind, highly unlikely. The worst case scenario that is that Britain faces the common external tariff. 
tariff slapped on goods coming into the customs union from outside it. On average, this is estimated to be 2 to 3%, which I believe can be mitigated by the other benefits. As we have seen, British exports have been growing faster outside the EU than within it, a reflection that that tariff is not prohibitive. On agricultural goods, quotas would apply, and on, uh, on lamb, uh, on beef, on poultry, uh, dairy products, and on wheat, a quota would have to be negotiated with the EU to uh, enable um, the uh, swift export of those goods and to ensure that British farmers still had access to the EU markets. Again, not outside the realms of possibility, but it gives us a lot more flexibility and power to determine how our farmers will be uh, placed in the new trade settlement. In any event, Brussels cannot suddenly bump up tariffs as an act of spite or vengeance to punish Britain because, uh, because we are leaving the customs union. And that, again, is because WTO rules um, uh, uh, bite to protect uh, to protect that from to prevent that from happening, and they do that with um, most favoured nation status, which compels equal treatment, the principle of non-discrimination, and um, uh, the the fact that uh, Brussels cannot impose rules which would somehow have a protectionist purpose. So, to my mind, um, WTO really does act as um, a, a real safeguard against any punitive action. But let's look at our starting point. Britain and the EU are beginning from a point of zero tariffs and quotas with each other. And I don't think um, that the prospect of really dramatically increasing those is likely. What about services? This is a different issue altogether. Here, protectionist regulations and rules can be imposed by the EU to exclude British competition um, and privilege local vested interests. Britain is a major exporter of services. 80% of our exports are services. So any trade deal really must include provision for market access and national treatment in services and mutual recognition of qualifications where needed. Um, so I think that we may wish to trade freely um, in um, uh, the EU may wish to trade freely with us in goods, but it might seek to regulate us out of services. Um, but that would be possible even if Britain were in the EU. But let's just keep perspective on services. Regarding financial services, where Britain is a big exporter, um, where, and many of these services are sold in EU countries, um, the, the statistics paint a very interesting picture. Um, in terms of our financial services, the EU took 33% of our total exports in, 30, um, in 2014, 33% of our total exports, according to the ONS. But consider this, in 2014, the US alone was taking 31% of our financial services, and yet there's no free trade agreement with the US. So the absence of a free trade agreement does not preclude significant trade with those countries. So just to conclude, I think we should seek a free trade services deal with the EU, EU, as with the rest of the world, but not at the expense of burdening London or Edinburgh, indeed, with rules um, and standards that put Britain at a competitive disadvantage. We have a lot to gain for our financial services. Regulations, bans, financial, the financial transaction taxes, all imposed by Brussels, will no longer apply if we leave the customs union and we strike a deal on services. We have a chance to create a free trading, deregulated offshore Britain, trading with the EU and the rest of the world, working for the dismantling of tariffs and non-tariff barriers, but prepared to reduce its own barriers unilaterally if needed. We should retain uh, our alliances with e the, the EU, commensurate with full sovereignty, for example, including our military commitment to NATO and our open markets through EFTA, or an EFTA-type agreement, but we should also strengthen our ties with non-EU countries. We have a bright future as a fully independent, sovereign country, as a friend, ally, and partner with our European neighbours. Brexit is a golden opportunity for trade. Thank you.